Back to the Soviet rocket video, <laughs> the epic video, probably the most epically researched video you've done. I mean, it's like, is it, it's true, it's truly an epic video. Uh, so, what, uh, again, called the entire Soviet rocket engine family tree, took you two years to research. What are some fascinating things you've learned about the history of rocket engines in the Soviet Union and in general um, through the process of making that video? The, the coolest thing to me is how it's this weird blend for the, the Soviet Union went through a an insane iteration process and made so many engines. Like I didn't even touch, you know, any like maneuvering thrusters or missile engines. Like I only really dealt with main propulsion engines on orbital rockets and there's still way too many to talk about. I mean, it's still dozens and dozens of engines. And I, I could have gone deeper into this, which is hilarious. Um, they iterated so much, made a new engine for just at the drop of a hat. Yet they still also like did super primitive things. You know, they they physically are still today lighting the main combustion chambers of the Soyuz engines of the RD-107 and RD-108 with essentially matchsticks. Like they literally stick a T-shaped thing up into the chamber and have a, a pyrotechnic in, in, the, in it mm -hmm. that ignites the actual propellants in the combustion chamber. It's not the most elegant solution in the world. Yeah. They're still using that. So they went from like the whole spectrum of like, it's a the mixture of like, make it better, faster, harder, stronger, gooder all the way around to also, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's like, it employs all of the above. So it's like, it's uh, a lot of innovation, but also they use duct tape. So it's like, <laughs> yes. so like all of it together. Yes. Uh -huh. That's exactly <laughs> like, that's exactly the way to put it. And and they did things that are insane. They developed a full flow stage combustion cycle engine. This engine, had it been used, I mean, it would have put the F, it was same relative size as the F1 engine on the Saturn V, like in that same category, way up there of like, you know, 6.7, uh, like mega newtons of thrust or something around, and then the F1 is like seven or something. It's, it's huge, yet way more complicated, way more efficient, way just better engine in that sense, as far as, as, far as performance goes. Yet it never flew. It never left the stand. You know, they they never built the rocket around it. The N1, which was the, the you know the most powerful rocket to have flown so far to date, um, like it never made it through its first stage burn. It, it, all four attempts failed spectacularly, and yet it had so much technology on it that was still unrivaled today. Almost like finally now we're beating it. The NK33s that they developed for that rocket, like finally today were to the point of like having better engines than they built in the 60s. Yeah, what stands out to you uh, from the N1 family of rocket engines? Well, it's interesting because the N1 uh, was the Kuznetsov Design Bureau and he was actually an aircraft manufacturer. So he was one of the first people outside of kind of the the missile and rocket program. You know, he had all these other uh, big wigs kind of in the other OKBs that were developing missiles and rockets. And then all of a sudden here comes uh, Nikolai Kuznetsov who, um, had never developed a rocket engine. And so his first attempt at a rocket engines was the NK series, NK-15, NK-33. And they were amazing. They were brilliant. They were these wonderful closed cycle oxygen rich engines um, that were that were awesome. They were awesome engines. And that were, you know, because, <laughs> I, I love that because he, his direct um, boss, he, since he wasn't necessarily in the, in the aerospace, you know, or in the, I guess the rocket missile defense world, um, he didn't have to, ad, uh, at the fall of the Soviet Union, he didn't have to give away all of his things to the same people as the other people. Mm -hmm. So he hid, you know, like 80 of his engines in a hangar. And uh, and then we still literally use them in the United States. We used altogether, I think it was like eight or 10 of them, um, repurposed them as they're called AJ-26s in the United States. But like we still were flying Soviet rocket engines in the 2000s because they were better than engines we are building today. Like that's, to me, that's my favorite fact about the N1 <laughs> rocket engines, that they're still that good, that, that they were the, the best choice for, at the time, uh, orbital sciences. Some of the culture that uh, engineering has led to these things that still work, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, you said that the RD-171 is one of the coolest engines ever made. Why is that? Yeah, uh, so one of the fun things about the Soviet engines is it'll look like multi, a lot of their engines look like multiple engines because you see multiple nozzles, you see multiple combustion chambers, and you'd think, well, obviously, you know, the 
nozzle is the engine, right? Mm -hmm. But what they actually would do, the, the real, the real heart and the real power of the rocket engine actually comes from the turbo pumps, comes from the, the pumps themselves. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, that, that includes the turbine and the, and the actual um, pumps that flow the propellant into the, into the chambers. And so the Soviet Union was incredible at, at developing these closed cycle, high powered turbo pumps. But if you try to scale the combustion chamber too big, um, you end up with what's called um, combustion instability. You're, you're having, you have such a, a large surface area of crazy flames, you know, and, and combustion happening, they can get these weird pockets and oscillations and frequencies and, and they just couldn't make big combustion chambers. They never figured it out. They never quite, well, they, they did actually kind of figure it out, but they, they didn't like it. <laughs> so they ended up just shrinking down and having small combustion chambers and just sending, splitting the pipes, basically, instead of one fuel pump going into or one pipe, going into one combustion chamber and one oxidizer pi pipe going into one combustion chamber, they'd split it off into two or four engine into two or four combustion chambers and kind of spread that work around so that they didn't c experience this combustion instability. So the RD-171 is like still to date the most powerful rocket engine ever built. The turbo pump is insane. I don't even remember how many, you know, like 200,000 horsepower or something comes out of that turbo pump in order to flow the amount of propellant necessary at those rates and at those pressures into the combustion chamber. So it has four chambers and it's just, it's just an absolute marvel of engineering. And yeah. And then the cool thing too, is specifically with the RD-171, it's engine, all four of those nozzles can actually pivot and, and rotate. Mm -hmm. And I just now, as I'm explaining this, realized that has to mean that they have joints, the, uh, like flexible joints in the high pressure pump lines mm -hmm. in order to, like, I never, I'm, this is the realization <laughs> I'm having right now, because normally you put the gimbal above the turbo pump, like the, the, the mount where the engine swivels so that you have low pressure f coming from the tanks into the pumps. And then you just have a straight, you know, fixed pipe flowing into the engine. So you don't have to bend that pipe and have it be dynamic. If they had the four chambers moving independently from each other, that means those four chambers all had to have a flexible high pressure pipe going, which I don't even, I don't know if that's, uh, why am I just now realizing this? Yeah, so, so there's engineering challenges with that. Insane. So the... I, I never even thought that was a thing you would ever could do, honestly. I would, I gotta look into why and how and what. Yeah, I where. wonder why that de design decision was made. So the easier thing to do normally is you would keep those nozzles fixed and then a fix like say the, the Soyuz engine, the RD-107 and 108, they have a fixed main combustion chambers and they, and they use these little vernier or some people got mad at me for saying vernier and verner engines that swivel themselves and those provide your, your control authority. So the, the main chambers stay fixed and then you get your, your roll and your pitch and your yaw out of auxiliary thrusters. Uh, by the way, did, did you get anything wrong in that video? That yeah. people told you about? Yeah, I a you? few things. Yep. Um, first off, we had a, a graphic error where we actually, were, we, you know, we copied and pasted a lot of our like After Effects projects. Mm -hmm. So our nuclear engines, one of them on screen says that it runs on RP1. It does not. It has basically all the wrong stats. We just didn't catch it in the edit, you know, that we literally yeah. copy and pasted. And I say it right on screen, but the, like in the voiceover, but on screen it's wrong. The other thing, and I'm excited to ask you about this. Uh oh. I watched... And, and I spoke with a lot of uh, Russian speaking individuals. We had a lot of research assistants that were reading and blah, blah, blah. I tried really hard to learn how to pronounce Sergei Korolev's Kur name. <laughs> and I'm still going to say it wrong no matter what. I, but uh, I, my understanding, yes. and from listening to native speakers, is closer to Korolev than it is Korolev. Yeah, definitely. Sergei Pavlovich Korolev. See, I, I will never say it that perfectly, but I I know it's not just Korolev. I mean, again, the the, the English translation of it likely I should have just said Korolev and said I'm saying it the dumb America way, but <laughs> but you rolled your R, <laughs> comrade. Okay, it's uh, excellent. So, uh, well, let me just ask you in the difference in, in the culture because you've researched so many rockets from so many different eras, the Saturn V, and just everything you're seeing now. Are there some interesting differences, especially when you look at the space race, between um, the Soviet rocket engineers and efforts versus the American? The, there's, I mean, there's definitely huge, huge cultural changes. And the, the fun thing is that they kind of spawned 
from the same, they, they have the same starting place. Both, you know, Soviet rocket engines and Americans all came from the Nazi V2 rocket and the A4 engine. Mm -hmm. Literally physically spawned from that because at the fall of, you know, at the end of World War II, we took a handful of German scientists and the Soviets took a handful of German scientists and they both got their own a little bit, some blueprints here and there and the others got some blue. So we literally have the same, it's a weird thing where we're starting from the same like thing and letting two, uh, uh, two divergent, you know, divergent paths go crazy on their own development. So it's really fun to see the cultural differences. One of the things the United States did is they really would kind of take an engine and and just perfect it more or less and then and not really evolve that much. Like they they I don't know and I don't know why. I actually need to do a history lesson on all of the US engines, but it's literally like uh, as far as orbital class engines before now. I mean it's like a dozen or two. You know, it's 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 a tenth the amount of the Soviets. And the Soviets just literally made up a new engine Every time they had a new, like, they wouldn't, uh, and it was like a completely different engine. <laughs> yeah. And, I, so I just, yeah. I, I wonder if there's some aspect to the culture, and I, I don't want to overstate it, but uh, there is more of a safety culture, I think, in uh, the United States. And I think if you care about safety, or rather, like, you have, uh, you're more risk averse. Yeah. So you care about safety more, about the value of human life and the risk taken there, yeah. that you will iterate less. So yeah. I think the Soviets, especially in the early aspect of the program, I don't want to overstate this, is um, some of it is just um, through stories, you just hear anecdotes. There are more willing to take risks. Yeah. Risks with human life, risks with uh, well, spacecraft. For example, the first uh, orbital space flights from the Soviet Union, the, the cosmonaut had to eject out of the capsule and parachute to a landing. Yes. Th that's not very well like known. And it wasn't, they hid that even from yeah. history as, as best they could at first because they were slightly ashamed that they couldn't have a full recovery system with their spacecraft. They could physically recover it, but they wouldn't have been able to recover the, <laughs> the cosmonaut in one piece. So instead <laughs> so, they had them just eject out of the thing and parachute to safety. <laughs> like, that's insane. And so there definitely was some some extra risks and, but also a freedom to just like push things to the limits and try everything. You know, they threw ev all the spaghetti on the wall. It's funny that most people probably don't even know the first person to space in America, and obviously everybody knows that. In uh, the it's it's like um, it's it's kind of interesting how the space race and even World War II, even like the history books, you ask most Americans, they think that America won World War II, like without America. Like they, the, the, the real heroes of World War II is America. You ask uh, British people, they say, and, and everybody has a pretty good justification, like without Britain, without Churchill, their, Hitler would have taken over the world. And I think probably the strongest case is the Soviet Union case, that they're the ones that won the war. The reason it's the strongest case is where most of the fighting happened. Right. Most of the death happened. Yeah. Most of like most of the destruction. But everyone has their perspective. And certainly on the space race, you know, the great accomplishment is the first man on the moon from the <laughs> US perspective. Yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. And then Yuri Gagarin and from the Russian perspective, is like first man in space. And that I think still persists and some of that in healthy forms is probably constructive to a little bit of competition just pushes all the all the great scientists on each side. Uh, but anyway, what do you think about this uh, Yuri Gagarin mission of the first human in space and the Vostok mission in 1961? Just in general, when you when you look back at that time, leading to the 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 first man on the moon. Yeah, April 12th, 1961, mm -hmm. Yuri's night, baby. That's a uh... Yeah, it's it's insane. What's insane to me is is the first person in space didn't just go to space. He went into orbit. Mm -hmm. You know, Yuri Gagarin flew around the Earth in orbit and re-entered. That's a, a monumental task compared to suborbital. So the United States did um, two suborbital flights in that same year. I believe in that same year, at least. I'm pretty sure in, in 1961. They flew for the first time orbitally in 1962. So they weren't terribly far behind to get a human into orbit. Like in the grand scheme of things, you know, 10 months difference. But at the same time, like the fact that the Soviet Union just went straight to flying someone into orbit is monumental. And I'm sure they did not do excessive 
uh, rigorous testing here. Because there is a space race and you have the first is important. Just imagine being yeah. Yuri. <laughs> what do you say when they're like launching him, like let's go or something? Like, uh, I mean, you're taking, uh, we're talking about you being on Starship, like you're taking a pretty big risk <laughs> being launched out into orbit. Oh, hopefully a lot less risk than what Yuri went through. So Yuri's, <laughs> Yuri, the, the crazy thing, remember the, those matchsticks we talked about? Yeah. You know, there's there's 20 main combustion chambers on Soyuz and there's four and 12 more Vernier engines that all need to be lit. So you're right, you're sitting on top of this, this booster and they light all of those 32 combustion chambers on the ground. And then it has this insane separation process between what the Soviet Union would call the first stage and the second stages, but we would call it like the core stage and the boosters. Um, they all, four of these boosters have to peel away perfectly from the core stage simultaneously. You know, if, if one of them sticks on, mission failed. If one of them doesn't eject properly or drags into the other tank, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's a goner. So the, the staging process of, of the Soyuz is, is insane to me that, that, that ended up working out. I, I it's just the, the technology in Soyuz. And I mean, re, more or less that same rocket is what's still flying humans that are cosmonauts from, you know, Roscosmos and going to the International Space Station are flying on a variant of that Soyuz rocket still today. It's still like that big of a workhorse. What do you think about uh, Roscosmos as it stands today, uh, its history and its future in uh, comparison to NASA and other national efforts and in comparison to commercial space flight? Yeah. I mean, utmost respect for the engineers involved and uh, you know everything that's happened. I think uh, Energomash is like still some of the, the one of the greatest engine manufacturers when they have the funding to do so, but man, it seems like they're they're falling from grace as far as uh, space prowess. You know, the Roscosmos went from having. I think they got very comfortable at the top of you know from 2011 until 2000 until 2022 or until 2020. They were the only ride to the International Space Station. Since then, like in it started, I feel like in 2018. Honestly, I think that's kind of when things. That's the first time I, I specifically remember a. a pretty nasty like thing happened in 2018. I think it was uh, a Soyuz mission to the International Space Station had one of the boosters not detached mm -hmm. and had to have an abort. But, you know, that that happened. Then all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's a progress being docked to the ISS a couple years ago that spun the ISS, cartwheeled the ISS out of control, followed a few months later, the Piers module docks to the I International Space Station, spirals the International Space Station out of control again for, with like a thruster getting fixed on. There's a hole in in a Russian segment, uh, there's, well, I think the most recent one right now, there's a, a Soyuz dock to the ISS that has a puncture in it and it's leaking coolant and will not be returning humans on it. So they're actually having to fly up an uncrewed Soyuz. Um, and that one likely wasn't a manufacturing error. It probably was like a micrometeorite puncture rendering the spacecraft unusable. We don't know for sure yet. Um, but it's just really been like this fall from grace where we're it, they have they have all the poten potential. They have some of the best engines, some of the the best rockets, and especially like right before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the the Buran uh, shuttle and the Energia rocket were incredible. Had they been able to evolve that into Buran two and the reusable Energia, they they had a fully reusable Energia on the drawing board, and like I honestly fully think they could have done it. 